The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 2. Agricultural Thought and Industrial Thought. Chapter 1. Bolshevism and the West. The industrial system, of which the communist state would be the appropriate flower, is still in its infancy, said Mr. Russell, for a century is too short a time for a social system to grow up in. The gist of his argument throughout, in fact, turned on the slowness of all real progress. If with Mr. Russell you believe in progress, you must be prepared for any amount of slowness. He asserted, on the other hand, not in disparagement but as a point to remember, that contemporary man still thought agriculturally, in terms, that is, of the growth of crops, of the processes of plant and animal life. His opponent he represented as an orthodox Marxian, and going to the fountainhead, he found the following arguments against the Marxian position. Since Marx thought and wrote his economist Bible, a lot of water had flowed under the London bridges, and the blood of many terrible tyrants had flowed too. Marx's thought matured, he said, before the Darwinian revolution, that is, before the change occurred leading us from the logical to the vitalist approach. That thought, on which Bolshevism is built, is a fish out of water in our present world, or shall we say that it is a land animal, whereas we are fishes, accustomed to a fluid medium. We have plunged into the element controlled by a great god flux of whom M. Bergson is, or was, a powerful hierophant, whereas Marx lived in a formal Hegelian world, in which it was all a matter of hard outlines, sharp, rigid outlines, such as you get in logic. Mr. Russell had been introduced to his American audience as this great logician, and they may some of them have been a little confused subsequently by witnessing this great logician freely using the arguments of a vitalist position to sustain his argument against the introduction of Bolshevism into Western communities. They should perhaps have been told that Mr. Russell has a different mind as a politician to that he has as a philosopher. Or it would be more accurate to say to that he began with as a philosopher. For the emotional impurities of the facile liberalism he inherits have gradually invaded his philosophy, and emoliated the logical erectness with which he set out, by admixture with the vase of vitalist pragmatical theory. Or it could be said that Mr. Russell had and has a first-class intellectual machine, which is, as is sometimes the case, independent of his personality. The great logician is a machine, but Mr. Russell, the person, is not a great logician. He is a conventional, not very far-seeing, routine English liberal. The great logical machine scorns to associate itself, apparently, with the mildly dramatic activities of this sentimentalist. This is what the chairman should perhaps have said. The audience would then have been able to follow the proceedings more easily. The words in which Mr. Russell explains Marx's unfortunate position on the hither side of the Darwinian flood are as follows. Later on, after Marx's thought was fully formed, came the biological outlook which is associated with Darwin, a habit of viewing human society as a thing that grows, a thing that develops like a tree, a thing that has a life by itself, a thing that moves in a certain manner not prescribed by the laws of logic or reason, but prescribed by the law of life. A kind of retrograde movement is suggested by these two statements. We are retrograde, as Mr. Russell sees it, because our thoughts are still agricultural, not industrial. But what is an industrial thought like? An agricultural thought is like a tree or a cabbage, we have already said, roughly, it would seem, and without examination, that the biologic welter of sensationalist life, said by Mr. Russell to have been inaugurated by Darwin, of whose evolutionary doctrine Bergson, crossed with Plotinus, is the emotional metaphysical expression, would be the equivalent of the agricultural type of thought, and that the logician would be more in sympathy with the industrial. So, either in one case or the other, the cart looks as though it were before the horse, or that mankind were in one sense ascending the hill, and yet simultaneously descending it. If we return to the industrial thought to find out what may be meant by that, we shall probably discover where the logic comes in in this contradictory movement. It is natural, we learn, for a logically minded man to regard human society as a thing that develops like a tree, that grows irrationally according to a law of its own. But that is also the way that the agriculturally minded man would regard human society, at first sight, it would seem. The cultivator, thinking of his pigs and trees, would instinctively think of human institutions autonomously maturing and withering on such a plan. The ideal industrialist, on the other hand, who had participated in the manufacture or creation of everything he saw and handled, would regard his man-made world as more within his control, just as the logician would. Yet, as we have seen in Mr. Russell's account, the phase in our industrial society that has superseded the, according to him, immature logic of Marx and Hegel, is the biologic phase inaugurated by Darwin. This is responsible for the following strange situation, that the farther men get away from nature, and their former agricultural pursuits, 
from trees and pigs, the more they employ the imagery of nature, of the growth of pigs and trees, to define the irrational, fatal, evolution of human societies. This at least is Mr. Russell's account of how it works out, and this no doubt unconscious paradox can now be examined more closely. Agricultural thought, or the mentality of the cultivator, will naturally regard every process brought to its notice in terms of plant and animal growth. But industrial thought will be disposed, on the other hand, to regard all processes, or creative possibilities, offered to its notice, in terms of manufacture. It will substitute the will of man for the more mysterious will of nature. In place of the living growth of organisms, it will be apt to reduce everything literally to a dead level. In its way of envisaging events and processes, a dead raw material will be what is to be acted on, and shaped by man for his particular purposes, infinitely docile and with no limits to its rapid adaptability. But for such a man as this latter one the ideal industrial montological world of Hegel that world in which, as Mr. Russell puts it, everything went by sharp transitions from this thing to that thing and then to the other thing, and it was all a matter of hard outlines, sharp, rigid outlines, such as you get in logic, the logical world would be much more to his taste than the biologic world of Darwin. So is it not unfortunate that Darwin should have come later in time and superseded Marx and Hegel, instead of the reverse? This seems to be a mistake, these personalities reached us, owing to some oversight, in the wrong order, perhaps? But Mr. Russell evidently regards this as quite in order, and in logical sequence. And I think, in consequence of this inattentiveness of his, that he has created for us, in reading the account of his American debate, a little confusion in the heart of his argument that requires clearing up. In passing, it may be as well to say that Darwin's particular evolutionary doctrine was responsible for an industrial type of thought rather than an agricultural. As it tended to reduce all intelligent organisms to things, men's thoughts and wishes to stones and sticks, it was easy for its followers to substitute motor cars and aeroplanes for sticks and stones. So it came about that, although it is true it dealt with a growth, since that growth was a mechanical growth it easily passed into the category of manufacture. Bergson's invisible arms and Ellen's vitals came later. But the industrial age itself is historically not a little contradictory, and would, by itself, encourage such confusions as those in which Mr. Russell's politician lightheartedly engages. For the European community which participated at the great changeover from the predominantly agricultural to the industrial age presented us with the French Revolution, which was made possible by the super-agriculturalist dreams of Rousseau. While these people bustled into factories, or were driven into them, building themselves more rigidly and irretrievably into a mechanical urban life, they exploded in dreams of bucolic freedom. Pictures of the freedom of the noble savage and the child of nature excited them to a great outburst at the very moment when, as they must from their own point of view have regarded it had they not been so full of a false and exotic emotion, they were enslaving themselves more thoroughly to men. So it has been in the name of nature always that men have combined to overthrow the natural in themselves. For their instinct to be so fallible, where, it would seem, so much is at stake for them for them to proclaim so ardently that they wish to be free in nature's children, and yet, in effect, to carry through great movements that result in an absolute mechanization of their life, can only mean one thing. It must mean that they do not really know what they want, that they do not, in their heart, desire freedom or anything of the sort. Freedom postulates a relatively solitary life, and the majority of people are extremely gregarious. A disciplined, well-policed, herd life is what they most desire. The naturalistic form that 18th century revolution took was because all violent revolution is Saturnalian. A rare Saturnalia is necessary for most people, but it exhausts their passions, and the rest of the year they are anything but their Saturnalian selves. The few years of youth is such a Saturnalia, but youth, in that case, is not synonymous with life. That men should think they wish to be free, the origin of this grave and universal mistake, is the, usually quite weak, primitive animal in them coming into his own for a moment. It is a restless, solitary ghost in them that in idle moments they turn to. The mistake can be best appreciated, perhaps, by examining a great holiday crowd. How can these masses of slowly, painfully, moving people find any enjoyment in such immense stuffy discomfort, petty friction, and unprofitable fatigue, you may ask yourself as you watch them. They ask themselves that, too, no doubt, most of them. That is the Saturnalian, libertarian, rebellious self that asserts itself for a moment. But if they have to choose between what ultimately the suggestions of the free self, and the far steadier, stronger impulse of the gregarious, town-loving, mechanical self, would lead to, they invariably choose the latter. So to be free for one person is not what to be free for another would be. Most people's favorite spot in nature is to be found in the body of another person, or in the mind of another person, not in meadows, plains, woods, and trees. They depend for their stimulus on people, 
not things. So inevitably they are not free nor have any wish to be, in the lonely, independent, wild, romantic, Rousseau-esque way. In short, the last thing they wish for is to be free. They wish to pretend to be free once a week, or once a month. To be free all the time would be an appalling prospect for them. And they prefer freedom to take a violent, super real, and sensational form. They are not to the manner born where freedom is concerned, and so invariably overplay it, when they affect it. This point is well brought out by Ford, the motor magnate, in his interesting autobiography. He there affirms, with an admirable candor, that a great deal of humanitarian sentiment is wasted on the terrible mechanical conditions under which his employees work. He insists that from long experience he is convinced that they ask nothing better than to be given a quite mechanical and soulless task. He himself, he says, could not bear it for a week, he finds it difficult to understand how they can bear it. But they not only can bear it, they like it, he is convinced. The testimony of such a very humane and intelligent man as Ford, with his vast experience of industrial conditions, cannot be disregarded. But the sentimentalist in the average man, the emotional spot that is a greater or smaller worst enemy to him, will not let him quite alone, and such a statement as Ford's would always be used by the sentimentalist minority in his makeup to cause trouble. No consistency can be expected with such an irresponsible factor always at hand and so easy to inflame. The agricultural life, for instance, offers more chances of freedom than the town life. Libertarian enthusiasts are constantly pointing to it. But most men hate it. The so-called free cities of the feudal age were contrasted with the neighboring villainage of the land. But it was a freedom for the trade magnificos, and not for the technically enfranchised slave who had escaped into this free urban commonwealth. The notion conveyed by the expression free city is still effective. The industrial slave looks down on his agricultural brother serf vegetating among his pigs and crops. To be anchored to a plot of land like a tree is much the same thing as being tied for life to a machine, only the former is healthier. But this is not how most people regard it. To be anchored amongst people is their true heart's desire, to share their life and responsibility, to be a blind, dependent, obedient cell of a crowd organism. It is characteristic of Mr. Russell that, still further entangling himself in his political web, he should draw a picture of the Industrial Revolution ending as it began if it is too violent and Bolshevik, in Rousseauism. If the leading nations all at the same time are engaged in a cataclysm, a Bolshevik revolution coming after a great war, there will be no one to help them out. A vast percentage of the population will die. The rest will grow savage through the difficulty of keeping alive. You will have a state where we shall have to return probably to hunting animals with bows and arrows, where a few of us will lead a precarious existence upon the wild fruits of the earth. Mr. Russell can imagine nothing more unpleasant than pursuing the bison and the wild horse with his little bow and arrow, in that he is properly orthodox. There are people, of course, who can imagine occupations less congenial, although far less industrial, than a healthy life on the savannas of Mr. Russell's horrified imagination beyond the coming cataclysms. But Mr. Russell is from any point of view not justified in curdling the industrial blood with this wildly agriculturist nightmare. Is it, on the face of it, at all likely that this Wild West holiday would be encouraged by the revolutionary authorities? Surely the expensive and perilous wildness and freedom either of the cowboy type, or that of the world of the migration period, is hardly likely to suit anybody's book. The urban and industrial organization so suitable to the communist program, and so popular with the mass of men, is certainly in no danger from revolution, which Mr. Russell persists in talking about as though it were a cataclysm of nature and not of man. The essential mistake of Mr. Russell, to go no farther than him, and still remaining within the radius of this particular debate, is that engendered by the confusion I started by considering, or else the confusion is due to it. It is precisely the biologic way of looking at things that is the absurd mistake. Revolutions, like wars, do not grow. None of the things with which men supplement and perfect animal life grow, but often things are put down to some alien natural force of fatal growth which are really less anonymous. All art, as it is found in science, painting, politics, literature, is based on this illusion of the natural miracle. The pleasure we derive from a poem or statue is that we have no sensation of manufacture, but of anonymous growth. It is no use to try things until people are more or less ready for them. You have got to develop, you have got to grow, people's thoughts have got to come up to the point where the thing is possible that is a matter of appealing to people's intelligence. It is a slow matter, because people's intelligence is not so great as we could wish. These remarks of Mr. Russell's suggest a further fallacy for which the biologic attitude is responsible, namely, that in a human society people's notions develop freely and naturally as a tree grows from the soil. Nothing could be more opposite to what is actually the process of their development, for, as we have seen, 
the machinery of education, of the press, cinema, wireless, and social environment, is directed to preventing them from doing that. And their happiness actually is found in having all biologic responsibility taken out of their hands. They do not like to grow, to feel, think, and suffer for themselves. They far prefer having it done for them. This position could actually be put in this way, they are not unlike the young man of Leghorn, on the whole, when first confronted with the major difficulties of life. If they could go back and not be born, they would. But the creative biologic life instinct has them in its grip, and they have to go on. Now, at this moment anyone who can show how they can at once live and not live, get through life, and get through it as a child gets through childhood, without responsibility, because so helpless, will be welcomed as a savior. The miracle of education answers this purpose, only it forestalls the event. It provides them with a system of habits which agree with their neighbor's habits, and from this coma they seldom wake. This is the kindest thing that can happen in the usual human life. The Bolshevik standpoint, that of the necessity of violent upheaval to terminate the present system of exploitation, is confronted by Mr. Russell's theory of biological gradualness. The Bolshevik belief in the necessity of a dictatorship over an eternally shiftless mass of anapertiva mankind, the standpoint advocated by Mr. Nearing, with whom this battle of wits was fought, is, Mr. Russell says, based upon too pessimistic a view of human nature. Whether you prefer the Bolshevik pessimism or Mr. Russell's optimism depends on the quality and extent, no doubt, of your political intelligence. The humanitarianism of liberal England was characterized by an unruffled optimism, the result of a spoilt and heedless prosperity which is no longer there. It was also an effect of that natural race egotism and aristocratism to which reference has been made. Mr. Russell inherits this liberalism in every sense along with his playful high spirits. It is a condition of mind, however much graceful good humor and superior indulgence it takes with it, that must arouse more impatience every day. As to the masses to be either educated up to the point where they become both good and wise, or dictated to, as they would be under a revolutionary dictatorship, Mr. Russell, then, announces himself an optimist. But these same people when they become a government, as in the case of the Soviet rulers, arouse nothing but distrust in Mr. Russell. About them he is a pessimist. Mr. Scott Nearing, he says, suggested that one of the great things about the Russian Revolution was the attempt to introduce justice and equality as between man and man. This, however, was not realized in the early days of the Soviet Revolution, nor is it one which can ever be realized by methods of violence and by methods of force. You did not have any degree whatever of political justice. Certain men held political power, and certain others did not. And it rested with the men who held political power whether they should take to themselves a larger share of the economic goods than other people, or whether they should not. That is to say, the form of government which was provided contained no safeguard whatever against economic exploitation, except the personal integrity of the politicians who ran it. Well, we know something about the personal integrity of politicians. And, although I do not like to say it, I believe that politicians are politicians in one longitude as in another. How Mr. Russell justifies his distrust of politicians and his belief in all the rest of the world, he did not inform his listeners. Politicians as a rule seem of much the same stuff as the people they legislate for. That may be, in the Western countries today, because they have as little to do as the rest of the people with the legislation of which they are the humble instruments. Yet it is presumably to these politicians, with whom he and his hearers are supposed to be a little bitterly acquainted, the politician is a similar joke to that of the lawyer or the mother-in-law, that he is referring. With such open power as that possessed by the Soviet leaders, greater power than any government has ever had before in the world's history, he says, Mr. Russell, like the rest of us, can have little acquaintance enabling him to gauge what changes, for better or for worse, the possession of such great power over others can affect in the average man. Yet in the future an even more absolute power, extending from one end of the world to the other, will certainly be possessed by some group of men or other. In another pamphlet Mr. Russell has himself forecast this situation and describe the power that will be so exercised as beyond the dreams of a Jesuit. Between the present Soviet dominion and that ultimate one through whatever vicissitudes the present revolutionary ideologies may pass why should there be a break? Any cataclysm that may arise this young power is today competent to control, and is already able to provoke or suppress such cataclysms at will. Of what use to that power, as has been said above, would the European masses be, running about with bows and arrows, laboring to secure a lark pie for their dinner, gathering nuts in May, or collecting a basket of edible mushrooms. Should not Mr. Russell's own conviction of the early collapse of Western society, his socialism, make this future a thing that it requires no second sight to foretell? So why, it is natural to ask, is he stopping to playfully argue whether we should become Bolsheviks or not, 
discussing alternative propositions of a very gradual development and education of mankind, fitted to the slowness of their intellectual processes, so that perhaps in 2000 years they might be ready for a little rational freedom, his benevolent politicians watching this gradual process meanwhile, age after age, with kindly, though perhaps a little sleepy, eyes? In this debate, contrasted with his less intelligent but single-minded antagonist, he exhibits all the weaknesses of the society that he conventionally represents. He accuses Mr. Nearing and his masters, the Bolsheviks, of being unscientific. The domination of the Bolsheviks in Russia is imbued with a theologic and not a scientific spirit, he says. By that remark he thinks he can discredit them. The man of science as he should be is a man who is careful, cautious, piecemeal who is not ready with sweeping generalizations, etc. The man who is scientific is tentative. He is cautious, is this even true? For does that really describe a great discoverer, or does it only fit the man who is scientific? The real progress of the world is a more patient thing, a more gradual thing, and a less spectacular thing than the conditions provided by violent revolution, he says. This tentative and cautious creature is the kind of man of science who was so well described by Nietzsche, the man who was no longer able to will anything, even in his sleep, whose resolution had become entirely absorbed by his cautions and hesitations. That on the face of it does not seem scientific either, if by scientific you mean such creative imagination as was released in the case of Faraday or Newton. But this tentative and cautious spirit certainly is the spirit in which Mr. Russell attacks or plays with the social questions of this time. It leads him into those limp and hesitating, half-despondent and half-bright, generalizations, and the mental confusion, too, which of all things you would not expect from this great logician. The function of science today is a very significant one, and in this definition of its uses no criticism of it is implied, for everything is science, in one sense, that is effective. Science is often described as the religion of industrialism. It is said to have provided man with a new world soul. Its public function is actually, however, as was suggested in the preceding chapter, to conceal the human mind that manipulates it, or that manipulates, through it, other people. For in its impersonality and its scientific detachment it is an ideal cloak for the personal human will. Through it that will can operate with a godlike inscrutability that no other expedient can give. It enables man to operate as though he were nature on other men. In the name of science people can be almost without limit bamboozled and managed. When in our opening statement we examined what was meant when the agriculturalist mentality was contrasted with the industrialist, we showed how nature was the power that the agricultural was concerned with, and to whose processes, owing to his environment and occupations, he referred everything as a matter of course. Then we saw how the industrialized man was taught to believe, and it is through the agency of the propaganda of science that he is principally brought to this belief, that it was still nature that was functioning in this new and different social evolution and it was pointed out how this contradicts what you would expect of the industrialist mind. For surely the analogy most natural to that mind would not be the biologic imagery of growth and of living organism, but rather the analogy of a man-made, dead, manufactured thing. So, we said, it was in reality man who had taken the place of nature in the industrial world the soul and will of man in the machine, and not the foreign element we describe as nature through the phenomena of crops, plants, climate, and the reproduction of animal life and except in so far as man is certainly no longer subject to its irrational impulses, that it is certainly no longer true to describe our immediate destiny as being in nature's hands, or in the lap of the gods, and that therefore, whatever happens to us, we can only say, well, it is decreed by nature that such and such a line of evolution, strange, unnecessary, and against all our interests as it may seem must be followed, and there's an end of it. There are, on the contrary, responsible human wills today, conscious and deliberate as formerly, and more powerful, responsible for all this mysterious natural growth that Mr. Russell compares to the irresponsible growth of a tree. The pitiless and inhuman character of nature has been overdone. We should have to look elsewhere, and nearer home, for inhumanity. One of the greatest innovations, and the most beneficent, of the Sovietic rule has been the check it has begun to put on the popularization of science. That will be like handing back the soul to the machine, and guaranteeing by means of science, no longer evident but occult, the smooth running of that machine. In conclusion, to give an example of a more obvious technical sort of contradiction afforded by these discoveries of Mr. Russell's, I will quote two statements that almost face each other earlier in this book. He, Mr. Nearing, spoke of a centralized dictatorship by delegates from peasants and workers, dominated by the Communist Party. Well, these delegates from peasants and workers do not really count in the government. Two, I should like to associate myself most wholeheartedly with the words of the chairman in regard to the recognition of the Russian government and the right of the Russians to choose their own government as they like. What is meant by the Russians here?
presumably the dictatorship by delegates from peasants and workers, which he says is a farce, though from the point of view of the worker it cannot be as cruel a farce as that it has superseded, and would turn into more of a farce if the workers counted more in the government. So Mr. Russell's wholehearted association with the chairman on the right and proper sentiment that the Russians should be allowed the right to choose their own government as they like is likewise a farce, only a stupid and ineffective one. Then, last, comes the question which was the main issue in this debate, of the gradualness, advocated by Mr. Russell, as contrasted with the method of sudden and violent revolution advocated by the other debater. The answer to this is involved with the question with which we started, or rather it would be answered differently by, 1, the agriculturalist, and, 2, the industrialist. Mr. Russell, as a logician, should give the Bolshevik answer, the logical answer of the industrial man. But as a politician he is very retrograde, he is an agriculturalist, so as a politician he gives the answer of Hodge. The industrialist, living in an abstract world akin to that of the logician, accustomed to the intensive manufacturing of things rather than to the gradual growth of living organisms, would be more disposed to believe in a catastrophic method than the farmer would. He would say, you can change all that is useful or important in a man in an afternoon, or at any rate from one generation to the next. I think he would be right. Whether it is desirable to change him, and into what, is a different question, but the agriculturalist would be slow, cautious, and tentative, at least in a couple of thousand years you could grow a new man, with all the resources of scientific agriculture at your command, he would say dubiously, scratching his head very slowly indeed with the point of his horny forefinger. But revolution is, in any case, as we have seen already, also not a catastrophic thing in itself, or necessarily catastrophic at all. Mr. Russell's true mind in this matter is very clearly shown in the following passage. I am not at all sure that the world is going to develop on the lines which Marx laid down, lines of schematic simplicity more simple than any human affairs ever are. After all, we know that one individual is different from another individual. Two men will grow up in exactly the same environment and yet they may differ very profoundly. In the first place, if the rulers of the world wished it to develop on Marxian lines, which ultimately is not at all likely, it would develop like that. Were these rulers world rulers, either an open or unavowed centralized government, or a confederacy of closely knit international interests, they would have the power to impose any orthodoxy they chose from China to Peru. They would be able to make the matron in Yokohama and Dublin simultaneously appear in a dress of lotus leaves, a vest of mail, a ballet dancer's skirt, or a crinoline, to shave her head, or dangle her hair in plates, to see that she had seven lovers, or to see that she confined herself to her husband to decree that she only had sexual intercourse on prescribed days, that in the grip of fashion, so much more effective than that of law, she was a confirmed vegetarian one week and a hearty beefeater the next. Every thought and action of both herself, her husband, and her family could be rigidly controlled without her knowing it, actually, if it amused them to leave her in ignorance of her puppet-like servitude. And she would be quite happy. All these things in any case can be observed around us in an imperfect, primitive form today. Already the standardization coming in the wake of the compounding of local national interests has made our civilization very uniform. Sport, the cuisine, the centralized fashion control, and so forth, imposing this unity more thoroughly every day. Without insisting on this tendency, the evidences of which are so accessible and universally recognized, it is legitimate to say that those differences between individual and individual in our community, or between the various Western nations, the differences to which Mr. Russell refers, are potentially a matter of the past. That past was truly nationalist and regional. Today neither the motive nor even the possibility of these differences between nation and nation exist. And the change has not been gradual, like biologic growth, but swift, like the effect of the appliances of the human will precipitating the leisurely habits of nature. With individuals it is the same thing. As the opportunities for individual business enterprise diminish, the great trusts relieving the individual of any particular initiative or energy more thoroughly every day, and as the mechanical pressure of public opinion, aiming at a highly organized uniformity, makes any personal irregularity increasingly prohibitive and not worthwhile, the differences between individuals, either in mentality, or personal appearance, or individual habits, disappear. They were the exuberant marks of a disordered age, before the doctrine of an economic uniformity had become also a social law. The individual tends rapidly to disappear, as do national characteristics. In this, too, Mr. Russell is using an argument for gradualness depending on conditions that no longer have any reality. For the pace, even, at which this standardization and drawing together is proceeding is in itself one of the most excellent arguments against his theory of a leisurely, conservative growth. This uniformity is the object of much abuse and protest on the part of the stereotyped regionalist reactionary. 
but does he not contradict the reality responsible for his protest? China for the Chinese, for instance, is the regionalist cry. But when China was actually for the Chinese, a Chinaman never saw, from year's end to year's end, anything but a Chinaman. Did he complain of this uniformity, then? Regionalism, Merry England, etc., is in reality a movement to substitute one uniformity for another, a small one for a big one. The really fanatical regionalist, confining himself entirely to Puddletown and its parish pump, would be surrounded by an absolute uniformity of Puddletownians. Every argument that Mr. Russell uses throughout his two addresses is open to the same criticism, namely, that it testifies to a very poor sense of the realities in the midst of which we live. Revolution, he says, for instance, is applicable to societies at a certain elementary stage of development. But when they become so organic as our developed industrial societies have become, revolution means too much destruction. It is as though the war had never occurred to enlighten him, for that meant destruction enough, and every wiseacre said it would be impossible, just as Mr. Russell says revolution will be. Or he says the struggle for existence during the cataclysm, a war followed by a revolution, would be so terrible that men would not be in the mood for any organized or rational form of government. That, however, was the state the Russians were in, agricultural or industrial, but their mood was taken very little notice of by their new rulers. Neither they nor any future people in the same conditions would be encouraged to have any moods. Or he says the cataclysm can only be brought about by unsuccessful war. He still thinks in nationalist terms, as though all wars were not unsuccessful today for all but the private individuals who promote them, whichever side technically wins or loses. The rather distressed amiability or puzzled apathy which would describe the state of mind of the average enlightened English or American public is one that it is kind to encourage, and the sort of discourse that Mr. Russell can be relied on to provide is excellently suited to maintain those publics in that bemused condition. There they sit and are soothed by the thought of the gradualness of the change demanded of them. It is perhaps kindness that induces Mr. Russell to occupy himself in that way. There can hardly be any other reason for it. The communist revolution can be trusted to take as much notice of the gradualness and caution, so typical of both nature and science, Mr. Russell says, as an avalanche would of other natural phenomena whose transformations are slower than its own. And this applies to it either as a catastrophic or a non-catastrophic one.